I want to welcome our next speaker, uh, Jason Hedex. Uh, he is CISO for uh, BuddhaBot, and uh, he has a great career. You all probably know all his achievements and everything. So I'm not going to go over those because you all can read about those on LinkedIn. What I'm going to talk about are two or three things which you can't find on LinkedIn because otherwise what's the point? <laughs> So he got started hacking in his early 20s by selling fake IDs. So that's something you should ask him later on. What did it mean? How much money did he make? What was going on, basically? Uh, there's a lot behind that statement. He is a professional paintball player. Former. Former? Former? Yeah. Not anymore? Not anymore. <laughs> okay. And his great-grandfather was Harvey Hedex, a famous MLB pitcher for the Pirates. Yep. So with that, take it away, Jason. And folks, have fun on second day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, the clicker. All right. Cool. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. All right, clicker time. Great. OK, so my talk, uh, I gave it at uh, RSA, and I've given it a couple places. It's called Tales from the Breach, a crash course in modern adversaries. And it's a little bit of a vulnerability talk. It's also a little bit of a defensive talk. Um, and it just kind of goes over the plight that uh, many of us deal with when we deal with an actual threat actor breaching our network. And so. Uh, I wanted to put it into a deck and talk about, uh, basically, it's a conglomeration of threat actors. So one that you're very familiar with, Lapsus, another one, eGregor, and then a couple newer school from the ransomware as a service ecosystem of Lockbit. And so it's kind of all conglomerized, if that's a word, into this deck. Um, and so I'll talk about how I did that. OK, but first, uh, I want to share a story that maybe you're kind of all familiar with. So let's see if this works. OK, so no audio. I will narrate. So this is the story of a threat actor. Now, here are our SOC analysts, and here's our threat actor, and he has landed on the network, right? And there are alerts going on. The SOC's like, what's going on? Um, now, we have some detections. Uh, we have a threat hunt, uh, basically, alert that says impossible travel for a user. And then we have our attacker drop in some creds from our Microsoft ecosystem. Um, and so we have some of our SOC people, and they're like, hey, something fish is going on. This shouldn't be coming from Russia. Let's look into this session. Um, and the attacker's like, I better not fuck it up. Oops, sorry. They better not mess it up, right? <laughs> so here's our SOC analyst, like, what is going on? Um, he has queried what antivirus the organization's using. The analyst is now, oh, dropping creds is not good. LSAS has been tampered with. He's getting very close to the threat actor. It's time to move. All right, so here's our attacker on the run from incident response in the SOC. Uh, they are traversing the network. Uh, here's more SOC. Here is uh, threat intel is catching up. We've, got, um, we've probably got some detection engineering being spun up right now uh, against our attacker. Everybody's on the move. You all know this feeling. You all know this feeling, right? Detection engineering has built some rules and has captured our threat actor. And we are in the clear now. We are beginning to remediate. We are beginning to clean. But the attacker has another account. <laughs> they have another, they always have another account. So here's our attacker scaling the infrastructure, and they are climbing towards what they always climb towards, the DC. So uh, our SOC is still trying to get there. Our XDR is really trying to do its best, but we all know that that isn't always uh, the way it works out. Um, they unhooked the EDR, uh, the XDR, um, my favorite tactic. And then we scale to the top of the domain controller, and we find out that there's already somebody here with us. We have a friend. We have a friend. So now we're in incident response mode. The SOC has to go into that painful, painful life of um, doing the breach notification, and, uh, and we have to do eradication. And, and you all know kind of how this goes. So. Um, so this is the story of a very, very kind of similar thing we've all been through. If you've led security teams, if you've been part of a SOC, a blue team, even a red team, you've probably used some of these tactics. And so I like to show this video because we've all been through it, and it's okay to talk about it. And so what I'm going to talk about is some of my personal story dealing with a, uh, mostly lapsus when I was the CISO of Ubisoft, 
Um, 22,000 person organization. We made video games, just dance, you know, stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to talk about that and then uh, some other stuff. So uh, when I went through this um, at Ubisoft with Lapsus and a couple other threat actors, basically um, I was really mad because we had a great team. I had hired some of the best people in the industry I knew at doing the best things that they could do. And then we got popped and um, popped pretty badly. And so I got frustrated and I'm like, why with a great budget and great people, great culture, um, all the bells and whistles, all the products that you could want to buy, we had E5, right? Um, how, did, how did this happen to us? You know? And so what I did is kind of what I normally do is I count on my friends. And it's kind of a core underpinning of this deck is you got to count on your friends. So I called all my CISO buddies. I went into research mode uh, during the breach and after the breach. And I said, hey, like you guys were involved in this thing. I literally just messaged some of them on LinkedIn or in CISO Slacks or anything like that. And I said, let's compare notes. Let's share thread intel. Let's talk about why as a modern attacker, they were able to get into our organization. So my friends are the Iron Legion, and of course, in this picture, I am Tony Stark. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, so what I learned, we were not alone, right? And we do have Microsoft's logo up here because uh, they were affected by uh, it, Lapsus, um, but a ton of big companies had been attacked by these threat actors. Um, this could have been five slides of uh, basically people they hacked into. And this is a conglomeration of all these conversations I had with these CISOs, basically. Uh, through Slack, through direct phone calls, I stalked some of them, you know, like whatever I could do to talk to them and understand kind of why our security programs failed. So this is a conglomeration of all of that survey data that I did with these CISOs and directors of blue teams and red teams and stuff like that. Okay, so one of the first things that happened to us that was special about the last few years was COVID caused a mass work from home transition for many organizations. So uh, because we hit COVID and all of the organizations sent their employees home, we didn't have enough money to buy laptops for all the employees, which meant they were using their home laptops for productivity work um, or sometimes even development work. Um, but it was mandated. Everybody had to go home. We were no longer doing an office. And even if we would have had the budget to get everybody laptops all at one time, Dell, our supplier, couldn't even supply it to us. So even if we would have had the money, there's just no way to get us that many laptops. I mean, maybe Microsoft could. You guys have you know, the bat phone and probably could be like, Dell, hook us up. But uh, at Ubisoft, we didn't have the bat phone. Um, and so all of a sudden, we had to switch to productivity and communication apps that we weren't really used to. Um, moved to Slack, moved to GitHub, uh, moved to all of these web-based SaaS um, that people could do productivity work from home, obviously Office 365 as well. Now, some of these machines were already owned, right? People had torrented on their home machines. They had downloaded a cred stealer. Uh, maybe a friend had sent them an infected PDF of a book. I mean, you never know how this stuff happens. It could happen to anybody, right? It could happen to me. I'm not saying that I'm exempt from whatever could happen to infect your home machine. You could have been fished um, through your Gmail, right? Like you get tons of Gmail spam from vendors. You could have been fished, right? And no one is above getting fished, to be honest. Uh, so what hurt us really was that most of these SaaS applications and web applications uh, were relying on cookies. And there is now a burgeoning attacker underground and market ecosystem, uh, especially in the RAS market, ransomware as a service, of selling both credentials and cookies from these campaigns that these hackers run. And so what started to happen is threat actors were like, hey, all of a sudden these employees are doing corporate work from these boxes we own already. Let's start selling their accounts via dumps and, um, and then we'll give them to other people. And so Lapsus, in many of the cases, would just go on to Genesis Market, which was the predominant marketplace until very recently. Genesis Market is like eBay for cookies and creds. You go on as a attacker, you look for a domain of uh, Microsoft.com or my company, Ubisoft.com or something like that. And you're like, okay, cool. I see that this pack is for sale. Some of the accounts have a at Ubisoft.com domain and um, I can buy it for, anybody wanna take a guess about how much you can buy a cookie pack for off of, how much? A Little bit more. 10 bucks. 10 bucks. That's how much our threat actor paid 
for a developer account that had pre-owned from the laptop of it during COVID. So uh, that was basically initial access for them. They had valid creds for $10. Does anybody want to know after this is all over the slides about how much it cost us total with the breach and rebuilding and training and everything? Anybody want to guess? Well, 10 bucks. More than 10 bucks, <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. Anybody got a guess? 10 million? Close to $20 million. That is uh, reconstruction, training, programs that we have to build, infrastructure that was online, time lost from employees not working, games down. I mean, you, you conglomerate all together. The bean counters said, this is about how much we lost for 10 bucks, right? So pretty good deal if you're an attacker. All right. So what did they do? Um, basically, they had cookies and creds from these online markets to some of our employees. And what they would do is log into, they tried to log into O365, but many of us had two-factor authentication. Thank God, right? And we thought we were good to go. Um, but the default when you set up Microsoft um, O365 is that the user can actually uh, change their 2FA device. And you can add security controls in E5 uh, via the control panel to say you can only do that from a trusted network. You can't do that at all. Um, or you need to provide some other mechanism to identify yourself before you change your two-factor authentication. But these methods are not enabled by default. So we didn't have them enabled. Um, and so the attacker bought the cookies, encountered two-factor authentication, then just logged into the web panel with the cookie pack they bought, and change their two-factor authentication device to a burner phone. Um, and so now they had access to two-factor authentication, and they could bypass and get into most of our productivity apps. But they weren't really after our two productivity apps. They were after our VPN, which we had enabled with authentication through Microsoft. Um, and they did this to a lot of people. So in one of the cases, they couldn't, or in two of the cases, they couldn't just get in via this method. This was actually pretty smart because they preyed on the default configuration of uh, the control panel. But when they couldn't get in like that, they would look at Slack. And I know I have never done this, but plenty of people share credentials on Slack. And they would use the cookie that was already stored for this user in Slack and then root around in Slack for hard-coded secrets. And this is an MO of theirs completely through the lifetime of what they were doing. And eventually, sometimes they would find hard-coded creds that were either service accounts or developer-shared cookies or maybe APIs that allowed them another means into the organization. Now, other times, they didn't succeed with attacking Slack and pulling out passwords out of that. So then they would just SMS bomb people. And this happened to Uber. So this was a big article that Lapsus did to Uber. And so they had the username and password and cookie, but couldn't get into the VPN or couldn't get into the uh, site they wanted, maybe because someone did have a good configuration or was rolling cookies or something like that. So they would just wait until the user went out to dinner on a Friday night, and then they would just jam them with prompts to sign in to, uh, to their apps, right? So their phone would blow up with stuff like this. It'd be like, please approve, please approve, please approve. The push notification would keep coming through to your phone. And you're out to dinner with your family. And so some people would just click approve, right? They'd think it's some integration, like IT's doing some work or something like that, you know? And they'd be like, okay, approve. Smarter people would be deny, no. I didn't initiate a login, I'm gonna deny this. So when they couldn't do that, uh, they would find the phone number for the user uh, through OSINT means. And they would call them and say, hey, it's Uber IT. We're doing an upgrade right now. We need you to click the accept button on your phone. Now, anybody know this story? Did this work for Uber? Yes, it did. So they called one of their employees at 7.30 at night, said, we are Uber security, actually. They said, we're the security group. We're doing a security update. You should see a whole bunch of pop-ups on your phone. Can you please say yes? The user clicked it, and then they were in. So once you have access and new fresh session tokens or the old ones work or whatever, once you have access to cookies, credentials, they wanted to get into the VPN of the target, um, in which our case was uh, controlled by authentication that was tied into Microsoft. So they were in the VPN. Now, this is where they change methods um, from stuff that I have seen my whole career, which I think is really interesting. So what did they do once they were in? 
Well, they didn't do anything that's going to set off your EDR. They didn't do anything like any of your red teams are doing. Well, hopefully your red teams are doing stuff like this. They spent weeks learning about our network via documentation, via wikis, via Confluence, via logs they could get on network shares, via JIRA and CMDB. They read our help tickets. Um, they looked at our artifactory. They looked at all of our DevSecOps, uh, basically, websites. And when you go to these sites, except for the logging, except for looking at network shares, um, this is just web traffic. So does the SOC really alert on people just visiting web traffic? I mean, unless there's other, any other pre-indicator that they're owned? No, they're not looking at web traffic. There's so much web traffic on the internal network, right? And so they spent weeks just learning about our network. And by the end, they knew it better than we did. And invariably, somewhere in your network, no matter what company you are, you have hard-coded creds somewhere. Secrets management is the biggest problem we face as security organizations today um, on the internal network. And invariably, all of the companies that I referenced um, had uh, secrets stored in one of these types of places. Now, there are actually some other places that are not listed on this slide uh, because the survey wasn't completed by the time I finished this slide. But if you want to talk to me about the other places that these people attacked and some of the newer ones I'm seeing in research today for the DevSecOps pipeline, about where they got credentials and where they attacked with vulnerabilities for internally hosted web apps to continue their attacking your network, find me after. I have a list on my phone. We can talk about it. OK, what didn't they do? Well, if you were a red teamer, uh, these things all are very familiar to you, right? Like gold and silver tickets, Kerber roasting, pass the hash, net BIOS exploits, desync exploits, LMR, EFS attacks, SMB relay, WMI, DLL, they didn't do any of this yet. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that your EDR will alert on, hopefully, if it's tuned well. But they didn't do any of this. We did not get any alerts from our very expensive XDR EDR. And so uh, effectively, they bypassed pretty much everything we had been building towards. We had many of these in epics to improve our program. Um, we had seen these on red team reports and pen test reports, but yeah, they didn't use any of this stuff. OK, so unfortunately for us and many people I talked to, the end game for these threat actors was actually not to ransom us and get money. It was just for the lulls. They just wanted to bring us down. And this is where I learned a lot about security, is that if you do not have in your threat model that your attacker just wants to bring you down because they don't like you, or they ideologically disagree with you, downtime should be one of the first threat models that you build in to your organization, meaning that your employees can't work. How much do you lose every day your employees can't work? How much do you lose when your products are not online? And you need a tabletop for this rather than just like, oh, we lose PII from a web exploit, or oh, X, Y, and Z happens, right? I hadn't done too much of this, a little bit. We had done a little bit of table topping on like, what if this happened? But it was mostly in the disaster area, in the disaster recovery area, not if we got attacked and the attacker was still in our network attempting to keep us down. So. OK, so let's talk about how we responded, how people in the survey responded. Um, I'm not going to say I'm the best blue teamer in the world. I've spent 15 years doing offense. But I've taken the notes that I thought were pertinent. And if there's something better that I don't know, let me know. Come up, talk to me, I want to talk about it. All right, so for BYOD, right, those machines that we pivoted to for COVID, um, the home machines, well, we had to buy physical machines eventually. All these companies had to catch up, and the pipeline had to catch up. Uh, we had to work with Dell and, and get more laptops. And once you get you know, physical machines, you can put XDR, EDR on them, right, which is your first defense in a lot of cases. Um, and so we did that. And then in cases where people couldn't do that, they couldn't buy physical uh, you know, laptops for the people that were working from home, uh, they would move to um, virtual desktops, virtual desktop environment for people who were just doing productivity work as their primary job. And those could have EDR coverage on them and all kinds of access controls and everything. So many of the companies I talked to had ongoing IAM and PAM um, focuses, both in cloud infrastructure, internal you know, Microsoft accounts and um, access on the internal network, but it wasn't good enough. They weren't really going down to this level of, you know, can you access a website, right? Many of the failings I saw were that 
any user on the internal could go to your Splunk login, right? Like they could go to any of these Confluence wikis. Did they need that access? No, they're not on that development team. They don't manage Splunk. But they could get there because it's a website and many people didn't set up IAM for those types of web portals for security software and, um, and IT infrastructure as well. In our case, um, specifically, it was uh, VMware, uh, the APIs for VMware and uh, ESXi. Um, and so eventually when they took us down, they issued a VM delete command um, to bring down our infrastructure and then a backup delete command to destroy our backups, um, which was all handled via that infrastructure. So, so more focus on IAM and PAM was needed across the board. Uh, for most people I talk to, if you don't have a dedicated team for both cloud and internal IAM and PAM, you're behind the ball because it is a full-time job to manage accounts, to figure out, and in the two domains, cloud and local, um, to do this job. So um, we also did something a little bit different. We said, hey, if you're an employee of us, um, we will let you expense a personal antivirus for your personal computer if you do computing work from this. It is not mandated. We can't mandate it by law because there are many privacy based laws, but we said if you want it and you want to protect your machine, we have baked off all of the consumer level um, AV and EDR that you can buy, and uh, we know which ones we like, and we will pay for it. You can just expense it. Um, this was very, very successful. If you want to talk about the vendor we chose at the end, you can ask me after. I don't want to blast anybody. This was on top of Windows Defender, obviously, right? which does a great job, but doesn't catch everything. Um, so we baked off pretty much all of them, and we decided on one, and we said you could expense it. This helped a lot of our people. We also extended support to personal machines. If you had malware or one of these things happened, um, one, of these, uh, one of these antivirus caught you know, malware on your machine, uh, you could use our help desk. And they would help you reformat your machine, remove the malware, attempt to do whatever. It was a tremendous cost of service to the company. But it did save us a couple times. <coughs> OK, so what about you know, if we can't prevent it on that BYOD device, or eventually a cookie pack ends up on something like Genesis Market, which is on the right, what do we do about that? Well, I've actually had a lot of arguments about this. And um, I don't know, I think I'm right, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> is that uh, this is a defense in depth method. And, and basically, we shortened our cookie life cycle for many SaaS. We worked with those SaaS vendors to shorten it to 24 hours. Because what we saw was that the life cycle of the attackers and the marketplaces, it takes a little while for the attacker to sell the cookie and the credentials. And so if we shorten the cookie length to 24 hours and we have two-factor authentication enabled, um, basically uh, by the time the cookie gets to the marketplace, it's dead, which is nice for us. So on web, uh, we shortened it 24 hours, and on mobile, because it's a more secure enclave, we made it one week. Now, what that means for Microsoft and specifically is that our employees have to log in every day, which they hate. They hate it. You would hate it. It sucks. But it kept us secure. And we had to go on a, basically a marketing campaign to convince the users this is why we're doing this. I talk to them just like I'm talking to you. Like, hey, this stuff ends up on the bad web. We can't always prevent it. So this is why you have to log in every day. And we really want your help to understand that like, we know it sucks. No, it sucks you have to log in every day. But um, this is really a defense in depth method that we think is going to help us. So eventually, they got used to it. I got used to it. I hated it, personally. Um, cool. So we focused our threat intel teams on these dark net markets, Genesis, Russian market, SSS.com, a lot of the telegrams and discords, you have probably teams that do threat intel, or you subscribe to feeds and APIs. Um, but we focused our teams, both threat intel and red team, to look at these markets and monitor them and build sock puppet accounts to find stuff of, of ours that ended up on sale. Because we found that some of the vendors we used for threat intel actually weren't going to the level that we wanted to. They were getting to what I would call level one threat intel, which is like, have I been pwned? Um, dehashed, like some of these sites that sell credentials, but they weren't getting to either this level, Genesis Market, or the more hardcore level, which is the backdoor private Slacks, Discords, Telegram rooms, 
where attackers are actually selling the, bre the fresh breach data, basically. So uh, also, um, for stolen leaks, cookies, and creds, um, we started using the red team to do uh, GitHub scans with a whole bunch of tools um, to find hard-coded creds. Um, you know, these are things like uh, Git Rob and like a whole bunch of command line Linux tools that will look at a source code repo and they will tell you, hey, this looks like an API key, this looks like a credential that you've hard coded in this code. And it became a secrets management program, which I'll talk to you later. And then we started awarding in our bug bounty. Um, if you as a bug bounty hunter found a live cred that worked for us, we would pay you $500. Um, which is a lot of money for someone just finding something on the dark web, but again, $500 versus $22 million loss. I think it's a pretty good return on investment. Um, and so this we extended even more later, and I'll talk about it. Okay, so we also enabled code matching. I love code matching. I call code matching uh, MFA 2.5, right? Um, basically, if you, I mean, you all pretty much know. But anyway, code matching is when you enable Azure, um, the Azure login, to when you log into a page using credentials, it pops up with a number and then tells you to go to your two-factor authentication app and put in the number into that field and it gives you a map from where the login's coming from. The map saved us multiple times from continued intrusion because people were like, oh, this login's coming from Russia or China or something like that. That is not me and that's a little bit scary. And so it stopped uh, a couple of continued intrusions. Um, for the MFA stuff, um, basically, uh, any time that you are a new user for MFA or um, you need to change your MFA, we moved people into a special group um, that they were isolated in to just change their MFA and verify with IT. They verified, they changed their MFA device. Um, and then also we made them, uh, we made the specific change that you needed to be on a trusted network that we've seen before. Microsoft allows you to do this in the Microsoft control panel. Um, if Microsoft has seen that network or it looks adjacent to one that it's seen in the past, you are allowed to change your MFA. If it's a completely new network you're on, um, like not your common cell network or not, um, or not one that uh, you usually come from like your house, then you have to call IT to change your two-factor authentication and deal with the human and provide additional credentials. Oh, we also upped impossible travel alerts to kind of the maximum ability we could. Again, a lot of Microsoft technologies in here. Um, so same thing, so trusted location um, for uh, MFA change, again, I already talked about this. And then everybody was like, okay, well, to get rid of the, one of the initial things, the phishing, right, let's just move to hardware tokens or YubiKeys or FIDO, right? And this is one, I just kind of threw a slide in here, it's because like everybody will say that, oh yeah, let's move to FIDO keys. You have no idea how hard that task is for a big organization. How many websites support FIDO? How many support SSO? Uh, not all of them. And then when you do this implementation, there is so much tech involved in changing. Um, I mean, maybe it's easy at Microsoft, I'm not sure, but for like everybody else, hard. Um, and so Clint Gibbler does a newsletter called uh, TLDR Sec, and he did this survey on Twitter, or X, whatever you wanna call it, um, about uh, MFA and implementing it, and a whole bunch of people started responding, saying, here's our journey. We did some blogs on like the gotchas in implementing FIDO. And, um, and so this is a conglomeration thread, which is linked here that you can grab. I read all eight of these articles in our journey uh, to start to roll out YubiKeys. And then also, we had to do what one of these things say, is just roll it out phased. So first, anybody who had uh, basically, I don't know what you want to call it, but access to code that was sensitive, we rolled out to developers first with access to code that was sensitive. Anybody that had access to infrastructure or security web panels, rolled it out to them in the first batch. Uh, and then we went another batch to general users, and then we went to uh, another batch to all users. And so we had to roll out FIDO uh, in a phased manner to get it to work. All right, so I talked about secret management. So how many of you, your organizations, actually have, actually have a full-blown secrets management program? One, two, oh, a few, that's, that's actually awesome. Um, so, many companies I talked to during the survey were like, yeah, secrets management is like the kind of stepchild, nothing against stepchild, I'm sorry. It is like the, um, it is like kind of like an underserved uh, group baked under another group. 
in the organization, either development, DevSecOps, something like that. And doesn't get a lot of funding, doesn't really have a defined static plan. If you Google secrets management, there's about two vendors in the industry who focus strictly on secrets management. Um, so we had to go do research and build our own program. This is what our program looked like. So secrets management was its own staff, about five people. They were closely tied to DevSecOps, and they had four mandates, detect, prevent, respond, and educate. And I made this on my computer, so I don't know if it's any good, but it worked for us. So in the detect phase of secrets management, that program was stop the bleeding. So using Git secrets, um, building our own regex for custom secrets. Um, it was all about detecting and removing what already existed in our code repositories, in our wikis, in our chats, everything. And this whole team's job was to go out to those places and root out all the hard-coded creds or root out the shared passwords. The next prong of the attack is prevent, which for developers was pre-commit hooks um, to basically pop up in their IDE or their coding environment or even through the, uh, the code push or commit and say, hey, this looks like a secret. Are you sure you want to commit this to the code base? And if you are not sure, did you know that we use Vault to vault these creds? You can use this without putting us at any risk. So that moves on to respond, where we use, you know, you have to have somewhere for your developers to actually put credentials when they're using them in most cases. And then with the vault technology, whichever one you use, you set a cred rotation policy for master creds, meaning that those creds roll every 30, 60, 90, 120 days. So if at some point you're breached with one of those creds, eventually they do roll automatically. And then we had to educate our entire developer staff about secrets management, sharing credentials, and hard-coded secrets, which was um, honestly one of the hardest parts of this whole program. Um, letting people know that you just can't paste pads or code, you know, throw them on Slack, put them in Confluence, because people just didn't know. So we had a whole marketing team associated to secrets management. And they went out and they did the roadshow. And they said, here's some stuff that has happened to us. We used live examples of how we were owned so bad by uh, bad secrets management just to show people like this had actual impact. This hurt us before. So uh, that was what we did for secrets management. For architecture, we implemented jump hosts. Uh, and many people I talked to implemented jump hosts to get to infrastructure, web panels, and security product panels. Um, so you had to go through another round of authentication to get to these types of websites. We did additional network segmentation and IAM. And then we actually blocked <laughs> the VM delete command on the API for ESXi because uh, nobody really needed to use it. Like, there weren't very many times we were programmatically using the API to delete a VM. It was always pretty much a manual process like for us. And so we decided to spend the human capital to verify every VM delete. All right, other tips that I learned through this. Uh, know your local FBI field office number because they will deal with you and work with you to um, basically share threat intel and help you identify the attackers when you're going through a breach. Share threat intel, IPs and TTPs. Is there anyone in here from the old Dart team? Yes, anyone else? One person. You were by far the best IR team I've ever worked with in my life. You helped us out uh, tremendously. Um, when we were going through this. And then I think we helped you guys out too because eventually you guys did a threat intel package and blog on Lapsus in which a lot of that data came from Ubisoft's survey of all these other CISOs. And so this is the power of knowing people, sharing threat intel, and working with your vendors. Um, then we had to adjust our tabletop scenarios for a lot of this stuff because we didn't really have them um, for some of the stuff. And then what I mentioned earlier is we added actually our supply chain and SaaS partners to our leak credential hunting. So now if bug hunters find a credential for a help desk company that we use, they can identify like, hey, you use, you outsource help desk to this company. We found creds for them, they report it to our bug bounty. And then we report it to the vendor and we pay them. We don't pay them as much as one of our creds, but we pay them and then we expect our vendor to roll those creds because if they're active, that could lead to access of our data. And this was the evolution of kind of cred stuff. Um, so yeah, so for your customer service, your IT outsourcing, your IR vendors, whatever you're using managed, we would take those for us. Cool, so this is a sales slide. I'm sorry about that, I left it in the deck, my bad. But if you wanna contact me, I am on the X, I think it's X now, butobot.com, that's my company. I'm happy to answer any questions about the breach, about what we did, 
anything really um, after the talk or right now. So, yeah. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Round of applause for Jason. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you.